So what's good, TMG fam? It's your boy Ellen. I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. So listen, man, we're going to get into these unexplained mysteries, the craziness of the world. Before we do so, if you're new, hit that subscribe button, join the fam, and spam that like button. All right? Let's get to the madness. Number 20, Rosalia Lombardo. So why does this 100-year-old corpse blink twice every day? Let's find out. A weird sight what? rests in an obscure catacomb in Sicily. An immaculately preserved young girl named Rosalina Lombardo. Born in 1918, she tragically succumbed to pneumonia caused by the Spanish flu, just shy of her second birthday in 1920. Grief-stricken, Rosalia's father sought the expertise of Sicilian embalmer Alfredo Salafia to preserve his beloved child. Salafia's meticulous embalming process miraculously left Rosalia's internal organs intact. Even over a century later, Whoa. Rosalia's porcelain skin remained smooth, her golden hair tied back with a silk bow, and her crystal blue irises visible beneath her. I didn't even know you could, you could do that. Can you do that? Like, I know nothing about that whole world right there, as far as, you know what I mean? What, what's the name? What's what you call it? Morticians? Stuff like that? I, I have no idea. About, clueless about that word. I went through the experience, but I was so emotionally messed up when I lost my mom that I didn't really pay attention to what all they was doing. Grieving process is horrible. But I thought everything was hollowed out. You know what I'm saying? I've never heard about that. Her eyelashes. This uncanny preservation has earned her the nickname Blinking Mummy. Some visitors claim to witness her eyes opening and closing throughout the day. However, in 2009, paleontologist Ooh. Dario Pimbino Mascali dispelled the myth surrounding Rosalia Lombardo's eyes. He revealed that the apparent blinking is an optical illusion caused by changing light flickering through side windows. While her eyelids are not completely closed, they've never fully opened either. Muscali also uncovered the secret formula used by Salafia for Rosalia's preservation, which includes formalin, zinc salts, alcohol, salicylic acid, and glycerin. This formula and the arid catacomb environment prevented decomposition and maintained the mummy's appearance. The story of Rosalia Lombaro continues to attract visitors and offers a sneak peek into the preservation and world of the unexplained. If you found- I don't know. I, he would have had to show me that he stood there for 24 hours staring at, which I think is impossible to stare at something for 24 hours, not blink. So you can make sure that that thing doesn't blink. You know what I'm saying? And then how did the dude come up with the, the, the whole compound to use in order for that body to stay that well preserved? I would definitely like to know how he came up with that. Found this mystery interesting. Give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. And remember, even in the world of unknown mysteries, there's one thing that's not a mystery. Rosalia, the sleeping beauty mummy, has a better skincare routine than most of us. Number 19. Scotland Bridge leads dogs to their death. The Overton Bridge, located near Dunbarton in Scotland, has earned the nickname Dog Bridge due to the reports of dogs falling or jumping from it since the 1950s. Completed in 1895, the bridge was designed by landscape architect H.E. Milner as part of an extension to the Overton House Estate. Despite numerous investigations by the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, no conclusive evidence has been found to explain the strange behavior of the dogs. Theories have been put forth, including one that suggests the surrounding foliage and residue odor of male mink urine might have caused the dogs to perceive the steep drop as even ground. However, even this theory has been disputed by locals who claim there are no mink in the area. The current owners of Overton House, Bob and Melissa Hill, believe that the scent of mink and other animals may agitate the dogs, causing them to jump onto the bridge wall. They also attribute the unusual occurrences to a spiritual quality within the house grounds. But for now, we have no idea why dogs are jumping off this bridge. Number 18. The Disappearance of Benjamin Bathurst the disappearance of Benjamin Bathurst, 
A British diplomat during the Napoleonic Wars in 1809 has been a subject of much speculation. Bathurst vanished under mysterious circumstances while traveling with his courier under the alias Baron de Kock and Fisher in Prussia. Despite extensive searches and rewards offered for information, no substantial leads emerged. The initial assumption is that he had vanished voluntarily. But investigations by Captain von Klitzing and search efforts, including dragging the river Stiepnitz and combing the surrounding area, proved fruitless. The case garnered attention in both English and French press, with theories ranging from Bathurst's mental instability to accusations against the French government. However, more recent investigations by writer Mike Dash suggest that the mysterious circumstances surrounding Bathurst's disappearance were likely exaggerated over time, and he was probably the victim of foul play. Dash's research has shed new light on the case, leaving historians and enthusiasts intrigued by the enigmatic circumstances surrounding his vanishing. Number 17. The Pollock Twins in May of 1957, tragedy struck Hexham, England, when 11-year-old Joanna Pollock and her 6-year-old sister Jacqueline were in a car accident. The driver responsible was later discovered to be under the influence of drugs and intentionally targeted the children. The shocking incident received widespread attention in England, and the driver was eventually sent to a psychiatric hospital. Devastated by the loss of their daughters, John and Florence Pollock, devout Catholics, experienced a profound belief that the girls would be reincarnated as twins. Despite Florence initially rejecting the idea, and their families having no history of twins, she became pregnant and gave birth to twin girls, Jillian and really? Jennifer, on October 4th of 1958. As the twins grew older, they exhibited uncanny knowledge and memories of Hexham, despite never living there. They recognized- Would that be considered, like, fate? Or could you will that upon yourself? Missing them so much, grieving so hard? wishing for another opportunity to, to to be with them, say something to them, be their parents. Could you will that? You th do you think, because I know there's no real answer to that. We'll never know that enigma, but do you think we could will that upon ourselves? I wouldn't be surprised, man. You could put that out in the universe, probably strong enough to where it comes back. Nice landmarks, named their deceased sister's toys, and displayed similar personalities. Jillian even took on a protective role with her twin sister, resembling Joanna's relationship with Jacqueline. The twins also had reoccurring nightmares and fears related to cars, which mirrored the circumstances of their sister's tragic accident. Over time, the twins' memories of their past lives gradually faded, and they went on to live ordinary lives. While the case of the Pollock twins has been regarded as evidence of reincarnation, skeptics argue that their older brothers could have influenced their memories. However, the story remains a compelling account of an alleged past life connection. Cases of alleged reincarnation have been reported in various cultures and yeah. periods throughout history, often involving children who claim to remember past lives with amazing accuracy. Number 16. The Flannan Isles Lighthouse On December 15th of 1900, the keepers at Flannan Isles Lighthouse made their last recorded entries and what transpired on that day remains a perplexing mystery. The disappearance of the three keepers, James Ducat, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur, were discovered on December 26th by the lighthouse tender Hesperus. Captain Harvey, the master of the Hesperus, reported that upon arrival at the Flannins, there was no sign of life or response to their efforts to establish contact. Joseph Moore, the relieving keeper, went up to the lighthouse and found it deserted. Moore, along with Mr. McDonald, Seaman Lamont, and Campbell stayed on the island to keep the light functioning. An investigation into the disappearance was conducted, and it was theorized that the men had left the lighthouse during the severe weather to secure equipment or assess damages to the landing areas. They may have been swept into the sea by a powerful wave. The last written entries in the Keeper's Log were dated December 13th, but additional details for December 14th and 15th were found on a slate. The lighthouse was in order, indicating that the morning tasks of December 15th had been completed before the men vanished. To this day, the fate of the three Keepers remains unknown, 
leaving their families with unanswered questions and adding to the mystery of Flynn and Isle's lighthouse. Number 15. The Vanishing of the USS Cyclops The USS Cyclops, a Proteus-class collier, was a support ship under Navy command during World its final mission was to transport coal and manganese ore from Norfolk, Virginia to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Despite carrying 309 passengers and crew members, the ship vanished after an unplanned stop at Barbados. For over a century, the fate of the Cyclops has been the subject of much speculation. One officer, Conrad A. Nerving, who had been transferred off the ship before its disappearance, described the problematic nature of the vessel and its commanding officer. Nerving believed that the captain's irrational command methods had created a demoralized crew, and he hmm. recounted an incident where a sailor drowned due to the captain's actions. Theories about what happened to the Cyclops have ranged from explosions, to capsizing, to supernatural explanations involving the Bermuda Triangle. Nerving speculated that the ship may have split in two and sunk quickly, possibly due to missed storage of manganese ore in the holds amidships. The disappearance of the USS Cyclops is one of the greatest maritime mysteries in US history. It's closely associated with the infamous Bermuda Triangle, an area known for unexplained disappearances of ships and aircraft. See, now that convinces me right there. Because I be thinking like, okay, cruise ship is big enough. You know what I mean? I should be safe on this. Or at least I should have a chance. None, 300 and something passengers on that boat. And they have no trace of where they went or what happened. Yeah. I don't even think I'm safe on a cruise ship at this point, man. You know what I mean? I referenced the Titanic a lot, you know, because I think that was the one that really, truly scarred me as a kid to where I'm hesitant. But I got a little better as I got older and started getting on cruise ships and learned to love it. But still hearing how some of these jokers can just vanish just like that. No trace around the Bermuda Triangle? I want to st stay clear of that. Number 14. The Max Headroom Hijack On the evening of November 22, 1987, two TV stations in Chicago, Illinois were subject to signal yep. hacking. The culprit, who wore a Max Headroom mask and costume, briefly interrupted the broadcast and delivered a series of bizarre and nonsensical messages to thousands of viewers. The first incident occurred during the sports segment of WGN-TV's newscast, while the second took place during PBS station WTTW's airing of the show Doctor Who. During the first intrusion, the masked figure appeared before a rotating metal panel, resembling Max Headroom's background. There was no sound, only a buzzing noise. The interruption lasted for nearly 17 seconds before WGN engineers regained control. The second intrusion lasted about 90 seconds, and featured the masked figure referencing various topics and engaging in strange behavior, including displaying a can of Pepsi and extending a middle finger. The intrusion concluded with the figure being spanked by a woman while crying and screaming. Despite an investigation by the Federal Communications Commission, the hijackers were never identified. Various theories... And Therein lies my theory. I can't speak for nobody else's. When they say they were never found, it makes me look at them as the culprit. It's like they did it. Oh, we never found them. Maybe because it was us. That always be my type of theories. That's what I think about stuff like that. That was an inside. Maybe some part of the form of the government felt the need to do that to distract or something. I don't know, but that's the way I look at it. And speculations have emerged over the years including the possibility of an inside job or involvement from the hacker community. However, the true identities and motives behind the hijacking remain unknown. The Max Headroom signal hijacking incident has become a cultural phenomenon that oh, yeah. fascinates people interested in mysteries and media history. Yeah. Number 13. The Voynich Manuscript The Voynich Manuscript has remained a mystery in the literary world for centuries. Discovered in 1912 by rare books dealer Wilfred Voynich, the manuscript's purpose and meaning remain unclear. 
Despite many appearances and disappearances throughout history, the manuscript's language and intricate illustrations are still popular. The facsimile of the manuscript allows readers to explore its enigmatic content, including the Voynichis text and illustrations depicting fantastical plants, unfamiliar constellations, and naked women swimming in extraordinary tubes and green baths. Accompanying essays attempt to illustrate the manuscripts from various perspectives, but definitive answers are scarce. The Voynich Manuscript is a collection of botanical, astronomical, astrological, biological, cosmological, and pharmaceutical sections. It features drawings of unidentified plant species, astral charts, courtly figures, miniature female nudes, cosmological medallions, medicinal herbs, and a continuous text that may be recipes. The Voynich Manuscript has fascinated scholars, cryptographers, and enthusiasts for decades. We were uh, convinced uh, that this is simply uh, plain Turkish. Despite numerous attempts, no one seems to be able to definitively crack its code, adding to its mystique and allure. Number 12. The Bay of Jars in Brazil. Marine archaeologist Robert Marx's discovery of intact clay pots known as amphorae in Brazil's Guanabara Bay in 1982 made headlines about Europeans arriving in South America thousands of years before Portuguese explorer Pedro Alvarez. Cabral arrived in 1500. American marine archaeologists agree Jeez. that the jars appeared of Roman origin, and Marx postulated that they may have been carried on a Roman ship that had been blown off course. However, diver Jose Roberto Texiera had found two jars in the bay as early as 1976 and informed Marx about their location. Despite the potential significance of the discovery, Brazilian officials did not investigate further or even acknowledge its implications for the country's history. Hmm. It's interesting. Marx claimed that the Brazilian Navy obstructed his efforts by dumping silt in the bay imposing a diving ban and preventing him from re-entering the country. However, it was later revealed that Brazil's ban on underwater exploration and its resistance to Marx's excavation were due to his involvement in removing and selling Brazilian artifacts, which led to charges against him. Further investigation unveiled that amphorae were not ancient Roman artifacts after all. Brazilian businessman Americo Santarelli confessed that he commissioned the jars to be made in Portugal in the 1960s and submerged 16 in the bay to give them an authentic appearance. He had only managed to retrieve four of them before Marx's discovery. Guanabara Bay in Rio de Janeiro has a great history, and it's been a significant site for maritime activities, including the arrival of explorers and traders throughout the centuries. Number 11. The Toynbee Tiles the Toynbee tiles, or Toynbee plaques, are a puzzling sight found in the asphalt streets in various cities across the U.S. and South America. Wow. These tiles, approximately the size of an American license plate, carry inscriptions like Toynbee idea in movie 2001 Resurrect Dead on Planet Jupiter. Some tiles include cryptic political statements or encouraging people to create their own. Despite hundreds of them being discovered since the 1980s, the tile's origin remains unknown. Initially, the material used to make them was unidentified, but it's now believed to be primarily composed of linoleum and asphalt crack filling compound layers. Photographs of the tile surfaced in the late 1980s, but it wasn't until 1994 that they gained media attention. However, references to similar themes mentioned in the tiles date back to the 1980s. These tiles have been found in cities across the U.S., including as far west as Kansas City, north as Boston, and south as Richmond. Some copycat tiles have also been spotted. Never seen one in my entire life. Haven't been to Boston, or but I've been to Virginia. They said Richmond, right? That's Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, I've been there. Haven't seen that before. Never seen none of these. I don't even know how I feel about it. You know what I mean? Y'all y'all like that idea of them doing that? Or would you look at it as like tacky or you don't like it? You know what I mean? Understanding the history of it, I get that part of it, but some people ain't gonna like that around. It probably makes their city look kind of trashy a little bit. I don't know. Trying to respectfully. Let's say respectfully. North as Boston and south as Richmond. Some copycat tiles have also been spotted in other locations, like San Francisco, Portland, and Detroit. 
Interpretations of the messages vary, with some theories linking them to British historian Arnold J. Toynbee, Stanley Kubrick's film 2001 A Space Odyssey, and various conspiracy theories involving the press, government, and specific ethnic groups. Number 10. Hmm. Beale Ciphers The Beale Ciphers have been a subject of fascination for treasure hunters and cryptographers for decades. The encoded messages supposedly reveal the location of a treasure, worth millions of dollars, allegedly buried in Bedford County, Virginia, around 1820 by Thomas J. Beale. The Beale Papers, an 1885 pamphlet, tell the story of Beale entrusting the encrypted messages to an innkeeper named Robert Morris before disappearing. The second cipher has been deciphered, providing details about the contents of the treasure, while the first cipher remains a mystery. The third cipher lists the names of the treasure's owners and their relatives, but has yet to be decoded. Despite numerous attempts to decode the unsolved ciphers and locate the treasure, all efforts have been unsuccessful. While some believe that the whole story is just a hoax, pointing to evidence that questions the existence of Thomas J. Beale and linguistic analysis that suggest the documents were written later, the allure of buried treasure worth millions remains irresistible. Absolutely. The Beale ciphers kicked off a treasure hunt phenomenon, with enthusiasts and amateur codebreakers dedicating countless hours and resources to searching for the elusive treasure. But I feel like that's the thing that's kind of dying out. When I was younger, all of like the movies made like treasure hunts seem like the thing to wish you were a part of. You know what I mean? Movies like Indiana Jones and stuff like that, where they're going and looking for things inside of caves and stuff like that. Even the Goonies, for it being what it was, made you want to go on like little scavenger treasure hunts and stuff like that. It was different. It was a lot of those. I don't see too much of that these days, if at all. So I would think that would be something that's kind of dying out. Only like the the people from who who's gotten older now would probably still feel that that urge to hear about something and want to go on a treasure hunt. These this generation, I just don't see. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, the mystery surrounding the Beale ciphers has not diminished, and the hunt for the treasure continues today. Number nine, L eight mystery of the ghost blimp. During World War the U.S. Navy utilized blimps for coastline patrols to watch for Japanese submarines along the West Coast. On August 16th of 1942, the L-8 blimp, piloted by Lieutenant Ernst DeWitt Cody and Ensign Charles Ellis Adams, embarked on a routine surveillance mission. However, five hours later, the blimp crashed in Daly City, California, without its crew. The incident, which earned the nickname Ghost Blimp, captured public attention due to its mysterious disappearance of the pilots. Despite the stories that emerged to explain their disappearance, including capture by the Japanese, defection, or abduction by aliens, the most accepted explanation is both men accidentally fell from the blimp. The exact circumstances surrounding their fall remain a matter of conjecture. Despite the tragic outcomes of the L-8 mission, the U.S. Navy continued to use blimps for surveillance and anti-submarine warfare. Number 8. Bimini Road Mystery Bimini Road, an underwater structure off the coast of North Bimini in the Bahamas, is a geological formation resembling a 1,400-foot-long cobbled road, about 20 feet below the water surface. Consisting of large angular blocks of beach rock, some measuring up to 13 feet in length, Bimini Road runs parallel to two smaller paths before curving at the end. The blocks align in a neat row along the seafloor, giving the appearance of having right-angled corners before natural erosion smoothed them. This fascinating subsea structure was discovered in 1968 by archaeologists Joseph Manson Valentine, Jacques Mayol, and Robert Angove sparking speculation it might be linked to the mythical city of Atlantis. However, subsequent research has revealed that Bimini Road is composed of beach rock. This sedimentary rock forms rapidly, and is a mixture of various materials like pelloids, sand, shell fragments, foraminifera, and codician algae. The beach rock and layer of limestone beneath it became submerged due to rising sea levels and erosion. Despite attempts to link the rocks to Atlantis using uranium-thorium dating, such efforts were deemed scientifically flawed and inaccurate. 
and Radio Dating Carbon, conducted in 1978, estimated the age of Mimini Road rocks to be approximately 2,000 years old, contradicting the age associated with Atlantis. Although Bimini Road may not lead to the fabled city of Atlantis, it remains a very cool snorkeling spot for those who wish to explore this fascinating underwater structure. Bimini Island, where the structure is located, is famous for its clear blue waters. It's a popular destination for diving enthusiasts who explore Bimini Road, vibrant coral reefs, and the chance to swim with dolphins and sharks. Number 7. Nope. The Plague That Made People Dance Themselves nope. to Death the Dancing Plague of 1518 was an extraordinary event that gripped the city of Strasbourg in July of that year. Frau Toffi, the first affected woman, suddenly started dancing in the streets and seemed unable to stop. More than 30 others were soon affected by the same compulsion, and the number continued to rise. City huh? authorities decided maybe more dancing would be the solution. They provided guide halls for the dancers to gather in, hired musicians, and even brought in professional dancers to assist them. However, these efforts only worsened the contagion, and the number of dancers swelled to an estimated 400. Unfortunately, some individuals danced themselves to death. The Dancing Jeez. Plague of 1518 was the most well-documented outbreak of its kind, but similar events have occurred in Europe between the 10th and 16th centuries. Explanations for the phenomenon varied then, with theories ranging from demonic possession to overheated blood. In the 20th century, investigators- And they have no type of TikTok back then or anything like that. Don't act like I'm the only one that'd be seeing these people, just the, all these dances and different things going on. You know what I mean? It's fun, it's funny. But y'all gonna dance yourselves to death. <laughs> I be thinking that. So to hear this actually happened in history is wild suggested that consuming bread made from rye flour, contaminated with ergot fungus, may have triggered the convulsions. Medical historian John Waller's prevailing theory is that the dancing plague was a mass psychogenic disorder. The extreme stress caused by famine and diseases like smallpox and syphilis in Strasbourg may have contributed to the outbreak. Additionally, there was a local belief that failure to appease St. Vitus, the patron saint of epileptics and dancers, would result in a curse forcing people to dance. Number 6. Could you imagine waking up, not feeling good, but still having this strange urge to just dance like you're in your own Footloose movie? Like, could you imagine that dealing with... Man, and you can't stop. And you're seeing it, how other people are being affected by this, but you still keep doing it? Yeah, that's, that's something I don't think I ever want to experience. The Devil's Footprints The Devil's Footprints event in Devon, England, which took place in February of 1855, is a peculiar occurrence that's baffled researchers and enthusiasts for years. After a heavy snowfall, hoof-like marks appeared overnight in the snow covering a distance of approximately 40 to 100 miles in the ex-estuary region. The footprints resembled a cloven hoof, leading to speculations they were the tracks of Satan. Over 30 locations across Devon and a few in Dorset reported these mysterious prints, which traversed obstacles like houses, rivers, and walls. Despite numerous theories and explanations that have been put forward over the years, the mystery of the Devil's footprints remain unsolved. Skeptics question the extent of the tracks and note the inconsistency in eyewitness descriptions. Some tracks were likely hoaxes, while common animals like donkeys or ponies could have made others. Hopping rodents, like wood mice, may have contributed to some of the prints, including those found on rooftops. Number 5. 1897, The Aurora Incident. The small town of Aurora, Texas, with a population of about 1,700, is well known for its peaceful and charming ambiance. However, in 1897, an unusual event put this town on the map in a way that seems out of this world. Uh, the thing about it, they just pressed me for what's happened here now. According to the story, an unidentified flying object and its pilot crashed into a windmill near what's now known as Area 114. 50 years before the famous Roswell, New Mexico UFO crash. Upon investigating the incident, the townspeople discovered unfamiliar wreckage and a being they described as not of this world. Local newspapers documented the occurrence, and the pilot, Ned the Alien, was buried in the town cemetery after succumbing to his injuries. 
Ned's gravesite has become a popular attraction for visitors, Wait, who what? often leave trinkets in his remembrance. Despite the Christian burial and the need for permission from next of kin, attempts have been made to investigate the mystery. Ground radar scans have confirmed the presence of something buried in the cemetery. The story of Ned the Alien has become a lucrative op- I am really surprised nobody has dug that up yet. Very, very surprised. In this era we live in, I'm surprised. Especially with the skeptics, and they would love nothing better than to prove people wrong and say, listen, this was a hoax. Let's dig this up, put this to bed once and for all. I'm surprised. Opportunity for local businesses. Restaurants like Smokin' Windmill Barbecue, renowned for its specialty dish, the UFO, and entertainment venues like Martian Margaritas, which have an alien theme, make the most of the town's history. Aurora, Texas is now recognized for its association with extraterrestrial activity, making it a noteworthy topic and a source of pride for its residents. The Aurora incident is one of the earliest recorded UFO crashes in history and it's been compared to the more famous Roswell incident. Number 4. Havana Syndrome Havana Syndrome is a collection of unexplained symptoms experienced primarily by U.S. government officials and military personnel stationed overseas. These symptoms range from mild ear pain and ringing to severe cognitive impairments. Both were thrashing in their beds, um, asleep. The first reports of these symptoms emerged in 2016 from embassy staff in Havana, Cuba. And since then, similar cases have been reported in other locations, including China, India, Europe, and Washington, D.C. Despite being labeled as anomalous health incidents by the U.S. Department of State and other federal entities, the cause of Havana Syndrome remains elusive. While the U.S. government has floated various ideas, including attacks by unidentified foreign actors using technologies like ultrasound and microwave weapons, no definitive evidence has been found to support any specific theory. Recent assessments and reports cast doubt on the notion of a deliberate foreign campaign behind Havana Syndrome. The term Havana Syndrome is still hotly debated within the scientific community with different opinions on its etiology and whether it's a genuine medical condition or a manifestation of psychosomatic factors. Number 3. Mississippi's Phantom Barber In 1942, a series of mysterious haircuts occurred in Pascagoula, Mississippi, what? giving rise to one of the strange- Wait a minute. A series of mysterious haircuts? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. Do you see how bizarre that sounds? Just crimes in U.S. history. Dubbed the Phantom Barber, the Phantom culprit targeted Barber. young girls, sneaking into their homes while they slept and cutting locks of their hair. The first what? victims were Mary Evelyn Briggs and Edna Mary Heidel, who saw the intruder crawling out of the window. Mary described the suspect, but he managed to evade capture. Shortly after, six-year-old Carol Petey woke up to find much of her hair missing with evidence of a cut window screen. What? Mrs. Taylor, an adult woman, also fell victim to the unusual crime, leading to speculation that the criminal used chloroform to subdue the girls. The Phantom Barber's break-ins involved cutting window screens, snipping hair, and escaping without causing harm. What was wrong? What, what seriously has to be wrong with you in order for you to just break into people's homes and do that? Like, that's a different level of just insane crazy deranged like mental that that falls up under all those categories what is wrong with you to do that that's beyond weird and what's sad is those very well people like that could be living in our neighborhoods and we don't even know it although he occasionally left footprints they were insufficient to identify him the situation took a drastic turn when the perpetrator attacked Terrell Heidelberg and his wife with an iron pipe, intensifying the search for the Phantom Barber. Eventually, William Dolan was arrested and charged with attempted Hair was found near his residence, and his previous disputes with the Heidelbergs provided a potential motive. Despite being labeled a Nazi saboteur, Dolan maintained his innocence and was released early after passing a lie detector test. 
Really? Doubts about his true guilt have persisted over the years, leaving uncertainty about whether the real Phantom Barber was ever apprehended. Number 2. The Big Grey Man of Ben McDewey The Big Grey Man of Ben McDewey is a terrifying presence rumored to haunt the Scottish mountains. Though few have laid eyes on him, seasoned climbers have reported experiencing intense feelings of panic and fear when in his presence. Ben McDewey, situated in the Cairngorm in the eastern highlands of Scotland, is his preferred stalking ground. The Grey Man's immense size is immediately noticeable. Standing at a towering height of no less than 8 feet and covered in short grey hair, Due to his imposing stature, some have even compared him to the legendary creatures of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Those who claim to have come face to face with the Grey Man describe strange sensations, including dark blurs occurring in the sky, echoing footsteps that seem to follow them, crunching noises, an icy atmosphere, and even physical sensations of a cold grip or brush against the skin. Sightings of the Big Grey Man date back centuries, with occasional reports of him in a forest near Aberdeen. One particularly harrowing encounter was recounted by Professor J. Norman Cauley in 1891. While descending Ben McDwee in a mist, he heard footsteps following him, despite seeing nothing in the fog. Gripped by terror, he fled the mountain, vowing never to return alone. The sensations experienced on Ben McDwee, attributed to the Grey Man, have led some to speculate that the Brocken Spectre phenomenon may cause them. Brocken Spectres occur when a person's shadow is cast on clouds or fog, creating a magnified and often distorted silhouette. These optical illusions could contribute to the eerie experiences reported by climbers encountering the Grey Man. Number 1. Mysterious Sleeping Sickness the Encephalitis Lethargica epidemic from 1916 to 1930 affected an estimated half a million people in Europe Ooh. and spread to other parts of the world. The cause of this mysterious illness remains unknown to this day, and there are ongoing debates as to whether more recent cases were indeed Encephalitis Lethargica or something else. Patients exhibited various symptoms during the outbreak including neuropsychiatric behaviors, extreme lethargy, muscle rigidity, and varying disease severity. About one-third of patients died from respiratory failure due to neurological dysfunction, while others survived with residual Parkinson or neuropsychiatric effects. Survivors of the epidemic experienced prolonged lethargy, often remaining in a sleep-like state for years. Some showed a positive response to levodopa, a medication used to treat Parkinson's disease, suggesting a possible connection between encephalitis lethargica and Parkinson's. Research has linked poor sleep and disrupted circadian activity rhythm to Parkinson's disease, and reduced poor circadian sleep. rhythmicity has been associated with an increased risk of developing PD. However, the exact relationship between encephalitis lethargica and Parkinson's disease remains uncertain. Modern day case reports of encephalitis lethargica like symptoms are rare, and the true nature of the disease and its triggers continue to elude researchers. Whether the epidemic was caused by an infectious agent or an autoimmune response or some other factor remains a mystery to this day. So, all I heard was poor sleep. So that makes me want to go get a good rest. Do y'all get good rest at night? Mine be, you know what I mean? It'd be up and down. I get, I think I get close to the right amount of hours of sleep, but it don't always be like the best sleep. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not one of those people who like to take something or need something to help them go to sleep like that. No, I pass. I just don't think I get efficient sleep or, or whatever. But uh, maybe I need to start paying attention to that and do better at my sleep habits. Cause hearing that, that type of stuff scares me, bro. Yeah. I don't want to have to deal with anything like that. So, but uh, y'all get at me in the comment section, man, and let me know what y'all thought of this video, including the corpse that blinks twice a day. What do you think? Y'all get at me in the conversation and stick around and stay tuned, man. Leave a like, share the video. Till next one, I'm gone. Peace.